Let's go through the Fed minutes. They were released today at 2 p.m. I've had time to go through them. Um, I started highlighting a little later on. This is a staff review of the economic situation. That is on uh, page 5, as you can see. Um, and most of it is stuff that you already know. Uh, let's go down to the staff review of the financial situation. And there's a lot here on credit. So I want to uh, go through some of these things because credit is something that we want to keep our eye on. Conditions in short-term funding markets remain stable over the intermediate period. And uh, with reference to secured markets, this is the repo and reverse repo markets. Daily uptake in the reverse repo facility remained elevated, reflecting continued elevated assets under management for money market mutual funds ongoing uncertainty around the policy path and limited supply of alternative investments such as treasury bills that's it right there that last sentence the limited supply uh, if you haven't got that and it's money market so you got to stay in the money market you can't start buying the two-year bond their money market funds if you can't buy that well where are you going to go and they have the uh, the um, Federal Reserve, or I should say the FOMC, because this is the FOMC. The FOMC has in past minutes uh, noted that as balance sheet runoff continued, it should alleviate pressure on the reverse repo facility. Um, domestic credit markets, businesses and households continue to face elevated borrowing costs. And I highlight some things here. I don't know if you'll find them important. Yields for corporate bonds declined. And did they, right? While borrowing costs for leveraged loans were little changed at elevated levels, bank interest rates for commercial industrial loans continued to trend upward in the fourth quarter. Uh, yields on muni bonds declined during the intermediate period, uh, remained well above their historical average. Residential mortgage rates little changed over the intermediate period, uh, remained well above their levels in the previous tightening cycle. But the previous tightening cycle went to, what, the mid-twos? Um, they're projecting here the mid fives were, you know, sitting uh, four, four, five, four, seven, five, notwithstanding the decline from their peaks in early November. Uh, interest rates on existing credit cards continued to increase in recent months, and interest rates on new auto loans also rose through mid January. Uh, and we've seen in the household and credit survey from the New York Fed on the 15th that the increase in credit card balances for the fourth quarter was the largest in the history of uh, that data series and same with the increase in credit card balances for all of 22 the highest in the series uh, and uh, we also saw uh, some um, sharper upticks although from low levels but some sharper upticks for delinquencies for both credit cards and auto loans credit remained broadly available for businesses and households with strong credit quality but remained tight for lower rated borrowers well when interest rates go up uh, and credit standards tighten, you would expect that, right? New launches of leveraged loans were notably subdued in December and January, likely reflecting soft investor demand and higher reference rates on floating rate loans. In the market outlook uh, from February 19th uh, on Sunday, I highlighted the company that is having a problem with these uh, floating rate loans. Okay, overall credit quality remains strong. Although there was some deterioration for credit card and auto loan borrowers, and some predictors of future credit quality worsened a bit further. Volume of corporate bond rating downgrades outpaced upgrades in December, although the level of downgrades remained moderate. If we were just looking at the OAS over the last two months, uh, and I said, what do you think? Do you think there were more rating downgrades or upgrades? Triple C went from you know, uh, over 1,100 uh, to under 1,000. What do you think? More upgrades or downgrades? I think you would have said probably more upgrades. How could Triple C tighten if they're, if downgrades outpaced out, uh, upgrades? But here we are. I guess uh, it's this part, right? Level of downgrades remained moderate. Um, later on, they talk about the amount of leverage, uh, corporate leverage out there, uh, that it is uh, at, at high levels, but that um, serviceability remains very high. Leverage loans experienced notable net rating downgrades in December, but the pace moderated in January. Default rates on corporate bonds and leveraged loans remained low. That's probably why spreads are tight. Measures of expect this is this last uh, sentence here, uh, you know, is sort of a look ahead, right? Measures of expected default probabilities 
for corporate bonds and leveraged loans remained elevated relative to the historical distributions. That's interesting. Banks reported expecting, uh, expecting a deterioration in the quality of business loans in their portfolios over 2023. This comes from the uh, SLUS survey. We've mentioned that before. Credit quality of households remained strong on balance despite some signs of deterioration. Delinquency rates for credit cards and auto loans continued to rise during the third quarter. Um, this is uh, the, from the minutes from January 31st, February 1st. We didn't see the New York uh, Fed's report on household and credit until the 15th, and this is what we saw on the 15th. So. Maybe they had an early look at it. While delinquency rates on credit cards were still relatively low, those on auto loans rose above pre-pandemic levels. Hmm. In the January sluice, banks reported expecting a further deterioration in the quality of household loans in 2023, especially for consumer loans. Uh, this is the senior lending uh, uh, survey, senior lending officer survey. Uh, banks are expecting a deterioration in the quality of their business loans over 2023. Banks are expecting a deterioration in the quality of household loans in 2023. Uh, I think they're trying to tell us not to invest in banks in 2023. The staff noted that measures of valuation in both residential and commercial property markets remained high and that the potential for large declines in property prices remained greater than usual. Uh, and we've been watching housing, the housing price index for some time. It's given up, like, not very much, considering how much housing prices added in the last three years. Rates going from, or mortgage rates going from, you know, 2.9, 3% to 6.1, 6 6.2, 6.5%. Uh, and housing hardly gave back anything, gave back a little bit. Uh, and I think that's a function of the uh, supply of housing. Canada is even worse uh, based on the level of immigration that Canada is targeting over the next three years. It's something like 1.5 million uh, uh, houses just don't exist. They simply don't exist at this point in time. So uh, that's going to be uh, interesting to see it resolve itself. Uh, the forward price to earnings ratio for the S&P 500 firms remained above its median value despite the decline in equity prices over the past year. Although measures of business leverage were at or near a historically high level, the ability of firms to service their debt has kept pace with rising debt loads and interest rates, and there is the lack of pressure on the OAS. Leverage among private credit funds has remained steady for several years. And I said if we uh, are going to get some stress in credit markets, it's probably going to come from private credit. No, I, I, I should uh, be clear. I didn't say, I'm not saying it is definitely going to come. I'm just saying if there is some stress, it's probably going to come from there. On to the uh, economic outlook. The forecast for the U.S. economy prepared by the staff uh, for this FOMC meeting had, and this is, this is nice, had a somewhat higher path for the level of real GDP and a modestly lower path for the unemployment rate than in the December projection, reflecting both the recent data and a small additional boost to output from a lower projected path for the dollar. So let's unpack that statement. What they're saying is that based on what they saw in December, they are now saying for this meeting, eh, we think real GDP will be a little bit higher. And that level of unemployment that we saw in December, eh, a little bit lower, won't be that high. So less unemployment, more growth, and a lower projected path for the dollar. That's a forecast. They're projecting it uh, to go uh, lower. And I'll tell you, as I read through this, uh, the market reaction to this, uh, the sell-off, didn't seem quite warranted because this, uh, this reads rather dovish uh, overall. Um, so uh, the you know, the forecasting that they're doing saying, oh, well, growth will be a little bit more, unemployment a little bit less, inflation is coming down. And they do note that, uh, that it seemed that the reaction today might have just been, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the wrong reaction. That it wouldn't surprise me if going into Thursday, we had a nice strong rally in the market. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, do I agree with their lower projected path for the dollar? Um, Yesterday, I would have said, mm, 
I, I don't know that 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 you have downward pressure on the dollar with a Fed that's might be even talking to six percent now. But I'm not getting the feeling of six percent uh, in in the minutes here. I'm not even getting the feeling of five point five percent in in the minutes here. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to agree with the lower projected path for the dollar. The large unexpected boost to GDP growth from inventory investment was not projected to persist. You recall when we looked at, uh, we, we get our second look at fourth quarter GDP tomorrow. Um, we had our first look already, and I had pointed out that the one thing you don't want to see is negative uh, investment uh, and positive inventories. Uh, under the I section of C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And that is exactly what we had in the I. And they're noting that too. The large expected boost to GDP growth from inventory was not projected to persist. The staff still projected real GDP growth to slow markedly this year and the labor market to soften. Uh, but that's got to be in line with, yeah, we expect projected real GDP growth to slow, but not what we said in December and the labor market to soften, but not to the extent we said in, in, in December. I think earlier I said September, December, December. Uh, our forecast, uh, sorry, our, on a four quarter change basis, total PCE price inflation was forecast to be 2.8% in 2023. And core inflation was expected to be 3.2, both lower than in the December projection. Let me stop right there. Uh, uh, let's just let's just review basically what we've said here because once I got to this point I said well, you know this is good uh, for markets what's going on I, I uh, you know I, I did a few trades uh, after I read this and I said well let me put these trades on because this to me seems supportive of uh, you know the rally continuing uh, in the market um, real GDP Hey, remember what we said in September or December? Go a little bit higher. Unemployment, remember what we said? Go a little bit lower. Inflation, remember what we said? Go a little bit lower. Come on. Um, and these are not unrealistic numbers that if these were showing up on their own, I don't think the Fed would be saying, oh, we've got to do something about this. These are, these are not unrealistic numbers. Mind you now, these are all just forecasts and forecasting is brutally difficult uh, so you know <laughs> even though they're PhDs that are doing this it's still brutally difficult and, and subject to a lot of errors uh, let's see on a four quarter change basis core goods inflation was projected to move down further this year than remain subdued housing services inflation was expected to peak later this year than move down and core non-housing services inflation was forecast to slow as nominal wage growth eased. Well, there is a conditional statement, right? They smuggle in, uh, you know, the first part of the statement uh, uh, and sneak that thing in behind. It should be a comma with a capital letters and a clause. Uh, services inflation was forecast to slow as nominal wage growth eased. Well, that's what it's conditioned on, nominal wage growth. And I had said before in one of the uh, market outlooks that, you know, inflation now is in the back seat. Wage inflation is in the front seat because that's all that matters. It's the proximate cause of the services X housing that we see in PCE. Uh, and um, for the Q&A uh, that I had put up yesterday, if, uh, if you're interested in seeing how we get services X housing, uh, I show you uh, how that's done using PCE. So we'll get it again on Friday. Table one, take line 34, which is uh, total uh, PCE, the consumption. Uh, and then you go to line 38, which is the total consumption on services. It's a ratio and you'll get a percentage. Take 16% off that percentage because that is the weighting of uh, housing in PCE and you'll get uh, the what they call super core is uh, services X housing, roughly about 50% of, of uh, consumption. Uh, with steep declines in consumer energy prices and a substantial moderation in food price inflation expected for this year, total inflation was projected to step down markedly this year. Total inflation projected to step down markedly this year and then to track core inflation over the following two years. In 2025, both total and core PCE price inflation were expected to be near 2%. When they say near 2%, I don't know if they mean downwards 
to near 2% or near 2% being slightly below 2%, near 2%. I imagine they must be, you know, talking in the direction that it's going. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we stopped right there, uh, you know, they're talking about higher growth than we thought, lower unemployment than we thought, lower inflation than we thought, um, substantial moderation in food inflation, steep declines in consumer energy prices, total inflation projected to step down, and look at the word, markedly this year. They didn't have to use that word, markedly this year. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not feeling 75 basis points out of what they're saying uh, here. If they believe this, I'm not feeling 75 basis points. I don't know about you. The staff still viewed the possibility of a recession sometime this year as a plausible alternative to the baseline. Baseline is their soft landing. They see a recession as a plausible alternative to the baseline. The staff now viewed the risks around the baseline forecast for inflation this year as balanced. What was the previous language? Risks to inflation remain to the upside. Risks to growth remain to the downside. They now view risks around the baseline forecast for inflation as balanced. For beyond this year, the staff continued to view the risks around the inflation projection as skewed to the upside, reflecting concerns about the, potent, the potential persistence of inflation. Um, so maybe that is the, uh, that is the sentence uh, that is causing grief. But, you know, honestly, if I had to write this up and I stopped there, I would say, hey, guys, you know, we, we really should say something to keep the market down. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's uh, something there. But, uh, you know, going beyond this year, if you expect all this to happen this year, um, to say to 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 say that you view risks around the inflation as skewed to the upside, maybe. Well, actually, you know what? If 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 they're projecting a lower inflation rate for 2023, then saying that it's skewed to the upside, upside from that forecasted lower level. Okay, I'm interpreting it as I'm reading it. Okay, okay, okay. I can I can go with that. If if it if it means that uh, you see it skewed to the upside from your forecasted lower level because your forecast might be overly aggressive to the downside. Uh, okay, if we skip ahead and do it that way, I'm good. Uh, where are we now? Current conditions and the economic outlook. Participants observed that growth in economic activity in 2022 had been below its longer run trend and expected that real GDP growth would slow further in 2023. I, I kind of agree with that. Particip participants expected that a period of below trend growth in real GDP would be needed to bring aggregate demand into better balance with aggregate supply and thereby reduce inflationary pressures. Some judged that recent economic data signaled a somewhat higher chance of continued subdued economic growth, with inflation falling over time to the committee's longer run goal of 2%, Although some participants noted the probability of the economy entering a recession in 2023 remained elevated. Let's unpack that, uh, that sentence. Um, the first part of it is just saying uh, continued subdued economic growth. But the word here, it's economic growth. S subdued, but economic growth with inflation falling over time. That's your soft landing scenario. So some judged recent economic data signaled a somewhat higher chance of that soft landing, although some noted that the probability of a recession remained elevated. Uh, household sector, real consumer spending had declined in November and December, uh, anticipated that consumption would likely grow at a subdued rate in 2023. Excess savings accumulated during the pandemic had continued to support consumption, although several participants remarked that the importance of this factor would likely wane over time as excess savings continued to be drawn down or eroded by inflation. Uh, participants agreed the labor market remained very tight and assessed that labor demand substantially exceeded the supply of available workers. Okay. Uh, uh, let me read the next part, and then I'm going to uh, note something here. Unemployment rate had returned to a historically low level in December. Job vacancies remained high, and wage growth remained elevated. Uh, after uh, we're done this, uh, as a little surprise, uh, we're going to um, 
read some things uh, uh, related to ZipRecruiter's um, um, results uh, and what they and what they're seeing uh, in terms of the uh, labor market, uh, which is sort of at odds with what they're saying here, uh, and at odds with the jolts data that we seem to be getting out, or or they could just be a good leading indicator of what we see in the JOLTS report. A few participants remarked that some business contacts appeared keen to retain workers even in the face of slowing demand for output because of their recent experiences of labor shortages and hiring challenges. That is uh, the labor hoarding that is, um, uh, you know, uh, impeding the labor market's ability to come back in the balance. Participants agreed that labor supply remained constrained by structural factors such as the effects from the pandemic, including those in early retirements and the reduced availability and increased cost of childcare. Participants noted tentative signs that imbalances between demand and supply in the labor market were improving, with job vacancies and payroll gains declining somewhat from high levels, the average number of hours worked falling, and growth in wages and employment costs slowing. Some participants commented on the recent reduction in temporary employment which previously had often preceded more widespread reductions in labor demand. You'll recall that uh, in um, looking at the jobs report from previous months, I had made that point. I said, look what's going on with temporary labor. It's a leading indicator. Usually that falls off first. The average hourly uh, uh, work week decreases, overtime hours decrease. All these things happen first before you have uh, uh, bigger cuts in employment. So they're noting that as well. Um, keep, this, keep all this in mind because when we get to the ZipRecruiter uh, story, it's rather interesting. Participants noted that inflation data received over the past three months showed a welcome reduction in the monthly pace of increases, but stressed that, and I put this in green to really show the difference in the language, substantially more evidence of progress across a broader range of prices would be required to be confident that inflation was on a sustained downward path. So if we're looking for the bearish statements in here, there's one of them. Uh, core goods prices had declined notably, uh, but anticipated that price declines for this component would dissipate as the downward pressure on goods prices from resolving supply bottlenecks fades, which is true. Uh, if you have uh, goods prices dropping and dropping and dropping, they'll only drop so far. And then once they start to go sideways, uh, you're going to lose that deflation, that negative amount that you had month over month. The negatives will go to zero, making it look like it's inflationary, but it's not. It's just no longer deflationary. It's not inflationary, but when you go from no inflation or from deflation to no inflation, it will appear inflationary in the first in, in the first couple of reads uh, housing services inflation would likely begin to fall later this year which is why they're looking past it now they had observed less evidence of a slowdown in the rate of increase of prices for core services excluding housing a category that accounts for more than half of the core pce price index and if you want to know how to get that half you can watch the uh, q a uh, from yesterday, or you can do as I say uh, uh, in the PC report on Friday is take line 38 in table 1 divided by line 34. You'll get a percentage which is around 66, subtract 16%, which is the housing weight, and you'll get to 50%. Um, this is interesting here. Wage growth in excess of 2% inflation and trend productivity growth would likely continue to put upward pressure on some prices in this component. This is the first time hearing of the 2%. Uh, in Loretta Mester's speech uh, earlier, uh, or last week that we reviewed, she was talking about 3 to 3.5. And, and on Bloomberg today, another uh, uh, rent, uh, Krosner was on, and he mentioned the 3, three to 3.5 three as being the range that you got to get to from the uh, roughly 4.5% now. Um, I didn't highlight the middle part here because I find it confusing and maybe you can help me figure out what they're trying to say here. A couple of participants observed that changes in wages tend to lag changes in prices, which can complicate the assessment of inflation pressures. Well, that's like saying the obvious, right? I mean, 
so what it's saying is, well, wages, uh, uh, prices tend to increase and then wages will increase after and then prices decrease and then the growth in wages decrease after, which can complicate the assessment of inflation pressures. I mean, did you have to say that? Of course it would. But it's the next part. A couple of participants remarked that the poor performance of labor productivity growth last year was restraining aggregate supply that the productivity growth was restraining aggregate supply. So I think, isn't it the other way around? Isn't it that you can't get as much out the door as you would like that makes your productivity look bad? I mean, who, who would say, you know, we should, we should produce 20 more units? Why? Productivity sucks. But that's the point. Productivity sucks because you're producing too few units. If you produced more units, you spread all of those fixed costs that you have over all those other units, productivity increases, right? So I don't understand this. This The poor performance of labor productivity was what was restraining aggregate supply. Unless it's read as poor productivity growth uh, last year was restraining the was a result of restrained aggregate supply it just doesn't read that way which was contributing to imbalances between aggregate demand and aggregate supply and therefore to upward pressure on inflation i think it's the other way around i i, I can't see how we can say our productivity sucks let's not make anything i mean it would be like our productivity sucks we need to boost our output it, it Help me out here. If somebody can tear that apart and maybe leave a comment, what am I missing? Because I, I read it a couple of times and I thought, I, my mind can't, can't reverse engineer that statement. Several participants noted the possibility that as consumers become more price sensitive, businesses might accept lower profit margins in an effort to maintain market share, which could reduce inflation temporarily. And again there, I, I stop and I think, well... Why temporarily? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not following that. I mean, if, it, if it, they accept lower profit margins, the next thing they would do is look for efficiency gains. If they, if they, have, if they hit a wall on pricing um, and margins are being constrained, they always then hit it with efficiency gains. This is where you get the layoff announcements. So I'm, this... This must have been written by one of the newer uh, PhDs they hired, uh, which just hasn't learned how to, how, how to talk in common sense yet, I think. Maybe it was, <laughs> maybe that, or maybe the person was asleep and woke up and said, oh, what was that? I, no, no, I got it, don't worry, didn't want to get fired. Uh, financial conditions remained much tighter than in early 2022, I think we can agree to that. Several participants observed that some measures of financial conditions had eased over the past few months. Thank you. Remember what Powell said in his press conference? Financial conditions haven't changed. Several noted that they've eased over the past few months. It's like, okay, somebody's paying attention in there. Uh, it was important that overall financial conditions be consistent with the degree of policy restraint that the committee is putting into place. So they, some say, hey, look, financial conditions are easing, and it's important that we say something about that. And there was an opportunity that was missed in that press conference. Uh, uncertainty associated with their outlooks for economic activity, the labor market, and inflation was high. Upside risks to inflation, uh, participants cited a variety of factors. Possibility that price pressures could prove to be more persistent than anticipated due to, for example, the labor market staying tight for longer than anticipated. Uh, upside risks surrounding the outlook for inflation stemming from factors abroad, such as China's relaxation of its zero COVID policies and Russia's continuing war against Ukraine. And with Biden visiting Poland and Xi visiting Russia, uh, it's a lot of warmongering and saber rattling going on over there. A few participants remarked that risks uh, to their inflation outlook had become more balanced. Again, we've already seen this. We're seeing it again. Uh, risks to the outlook for economic activity were weighted to the downside. Participants noted that sources of such risks include the prospect of unexpected negative shocks tipping the economy into a recession in an environment of subdued growth. And this is what I've been saying in the, uh, in the outlook when I talk about the positions I'm taking that are purely just recession positions, like being long the December uh, Fed Funds Futures contract. That is purely a recession play because 
External shocks happen all the time, all the time. And when you're in an environment of low growth, they usually take you into negative growth. And this is what they're pointing out here. Sources of such risks included the prospect of unexpected negative shocks tipping the economy into a recession in an environment of subdued growth. Um, the effects of synchronous policy firming by major central banks, uh, simply because, hey, listen, it's not just the U.S., there's a whole world out there. And if we look at the revenues of the S&P 500, 40% of it come from abroad. So you do have to think about, well, 40% of those revenues are subject to countries where central banks are raising rates. Uh, and disruptions in financial system and broader economy associated with concerns that the statutory debt limit might not be raised in a timely manner. Uh, While well, we have time to keep biting our nails over that one, right? Uh, issues related to financial stability. Uh, what do we got? Vulnerabilities in the financial system associated with higher interest rates, including the elevated valuations for some categories of assets, particularly in the CRE sector. The susceptibility of some non-bank financial institutions to runs and the effect of large unrealized losses on some banks' securities portfolios. A few participants commented that international stresses had the potential to transmit to the U.S. financial system. This is, this is it, right? It's, it's, that's the thing that will cause a, 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 a lots of central bank action uh, in terms of increased liquidity and rates to the downside, a, a freezing of the runoff of balance sheets when this kind of stuff shows up. Uh, as far as uh, the CRE sector, uh, Brookfield Properties, uh, you know, hardly got, this story hardly got a lot of uh, attraction, but I've read it a couple of times. They have two buildings, uh, I think it's in San, San Francisco, where um, rather than roll over the debt, they simply just shrugged and said, yeah, you guys take the buildings, we're done. Uh, they willingly defaulted on the two buildings saying, no, no, we're done. We can't lease this stuff. It's over. And uh, I was reading, uh, if I could find it again, I'll put it in uh, Sunday's Market Outlook, uh, about uh, traffic flow in office buildings uh, as being measured by the card swipe. Whatever company manages a card swipe thing, still sitting at 30, 40, 30 to 40% pre-pandemic levels. And um, a lot of, uh, at least the ones that I've been uh, reading uh, uh, the um, reports for office REITs have not been good, have not been good at all. Uh, so I think there is some trouble coming in the office REIT sector. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Few participants remarked that recent failures of companies involved in crypto finance have had a limited effect on the broader financial system. These participants indicated that this limited effect reflected the minimal extent of the crypto market's connections to the banking system thus far, consistent with the risks associated with many of these activities. A number of participants stressed that a drawn-out period of negotiations to raise the federal debt uh, limit could pose significant risks to the financial system and the broader economy. That's the third mention of that uh, in the minutes. So they're talking about this stuff. Um, we're almost done here. Participants agreed that while there were recent signs that the cumulative effect of the committee's tightening of the stance of monetary policy had begun to moderate inflationary pressures, inflation remained well above the committee's longer run goal of 2% and the labor market remained very tight, contributing to continuing upward pressure on wages and prices. Um, they don't say this as many times in this set of meetings as they have in past meetings, that it remains well above our level. Almost all participants agreed that it was appropriate to raise the target range for the federal funds rate 25 basis points. Things get interesting from here, so pay attention. Many of these participants observed, this is a super interesting statement. Um, many of the participants observed that a further slowing in the pace of rate increases would better allow them to assess the economy's progress towards the committee's goal of maximum employment and price stability as they determine the extent of future policy tightening that will be required to attain a stance, blah, 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 whatever. Let's go back up the first part, a further slowing in the pace. Well, they've had a slowing in the pace of 25. They went, uh, uh, you know, 15 and 25. And now they're saying a further slowing in the pace. In other words, we have a 25. Maybe March we do a 25, then we take a meeting off, 
then maybe we do a 25, then take a meeting off, as opposed to 25, 25, 25. Uh, I'm not getting the feeling that this committee is going to move 50 basis points in March unless the March CPI is off the charts. Uh, uh, you know, like off the charts. And that uh, the next jobs report again is off the charts. I don't see this committee as moving 50. They're already talking about slowing the pace a little, for, a little more than just 25. Well, I'm not seeing this as bearish. This is this is sort of supportive of market prices right now. Uh, in blue, a few participants. We know their names. You don't have to say a few. We know their names. A few participants, Mester and Bullard, I'm looking in your direction, stated that they favored raising the target range for the federal funds rate 50 basis points at this meeting, or that they could have supported raising the target by that amount. Uh, so, Maybe one of them said, let's go 50. Another one probably said, yeah, yeah, I'd support that. The participants favoring a 50 basis point increase noted that a larger increase would more quickly bring the target range close to the levels they believed would achieve a sufficiently restrictive stance, taking into account their views of the risks to achieving price stability in a timely way. So you got a group of people, many, Many people said 25 and maybe slow it down a bit more. A couple of people said, come on, 50, man up, or woman up, depending on how you want to look at it these days. All participants agreed that it was appropriate to continue the process of reducing the Federal Reserve Securities holdings, and I don't think you're going to get anybody who disagrees with that. It's simply just too large, as described in its previously announced plans. All participants continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds would be appropriate to achieve the committee's objectives. What are they saying here? They're saying there's no pause. We're not going to pause now. We're not signaling a pause. But they have, in that previous paragraph, kind of signaling that, well, maybe, maybe March has a 25 and let's take a few weeks off here. A few weeks, a few meetings off and see what happens. However, yeah, yeah, we all agree that ongoing rates are, are appropriate, but, you know, um, I think this is just language to say we are not pausing. Participants observed that a restrictive policy stance would need to be maintained until the incoming data provided confidence that inflation was on a sustained downward path to 2%. Now, they said substantially more, and now they're saying confidence, but they never actually say, well, what, what does that look like? I think uh, in the next press conference, hopefully somebody will ask that question again, saying, you're saying this, but what what would that look like? Uh, I think they're trying to, you know, hopefully get something out of them, like, well, if we see six months or seven months in a row, or if wage inflation is below three and a half percent, you know, for two quarters, something. But, you know, what are you looking for? Uh, which was likely to take some time. On a sustained downward path to two, which was likely to take some time. Well, what is some time? That's an interesting question. Uh, this is the last column, by the way, and then it just goes into committee policy actions, and then we'll do a, a zip recruiter. A number of participants observed that financial conditions had eased in recent months, uh, which some noted could necess necessitate a tighter stance of monetary policy. Powell must have been over uh, at the uh, donut table uh, or, or the muffin table at that time uh, grabbing some more food because he clearly missed what these participants were noticing. Uh, I think after 8.30 they should just take all the muffins and, and donuts out of there. Participants also discussed a number of risk management considerations related to the conduct of monetary policy. This is kind of new. Almost all participants observe that slowing the pace of rate increases at the current juncture would allow for appropriate risk management. There it is again. Slowing the pace uh, at the current juncture, which they did at 25. Uh, so it seemed broad agreement on this. I just can't see moving up to a 50 in March. So I'm at, I'm at a 25 again. Uh, that's assuming that you don't have a, a, a completely hot CPI read uh, in March that just that everybody says, whoa, you know, 8%, where'd this come from? Se several of those participants observed that risks to the economic outlook were becoming more balanced. There it is again, more balanced. Participants generally noted that upside risks to the inflation outlook remained a key factor in shaping the policy outlook. 
Maintaining a restrictive policy stance until inflation is clearly on the path towards 2% is appropriate from a risk management perspective. Now, what, what they're saying here is that going too high is risk management. Uh, not going high enough is where the risk is. A number of participants observed that a policy stance that proved to be insufficiently restrictive could halt recent progress in moderating inflationary pressures, leading inflation to remain above the committee's 2% objective for longer and pose a risk of inflation expectations becoming unanchored. Last paragraph here. Few participants observed that money markets could experience some temporary pressures as reserves declined uh, if use of the Federal Reserve's uh, reverse repo facility continued to remain high. They noted, however, that such pressures, should they occur, would likely cause an upward repricing of private money market rates that could encourage money uh, market participants to reduce their use of the facility. Well, that's how you do it. Just offer higher rates, right? Let's have a look at ZipRecruiter. Okay, this is uh, ZipRecruiter's shareholder letter for Q4 2022. And uh, in it, they give guidance for uh, 2023. I think perhaps they might want to change the smiley face on this one based on their guidance. Everyone's smiling. I don't think they're smiling right now. I mean, this guy's still smiling, right? Let's go down uh, to uh, financial outlook. You tell me if you'll be smiling after this. Uh, and this, this is, um, you know, in contravention of the data we've seen for the jobs report for January for uh, initial claims that we've been seeing, uh, in contravention for the increased uh, job openings we saw on the JOLTS report and uh, in terms of the quits rate. So is this a company specific thing? Are there, uh, uh, is there a move away from paying for your job postings to getting them free somewhere? Or is this really uh, a closer uh, uh, finger on the pulse of the economy? Uh, you know, you'll have to figure that out, but let's just uh, see what they have to say. Uh, January 2023 performance and implications for 2023 labor market outlook. With an increasingly uncertain macroeconomic backdrop, employers have moderated their hiring plans and reduced their recruitment budgets in the first weeks of this year. Online job postings in our marketplace remained in line with the low point of the 2022 holiday season rather than following the long-standing seasonal pattern of beginning a run-up in January. The weakness in 2023 is more pronounced among small to medium-sized businesses than among larger enterprises. As a result, January's revenue was down 15% year over year. Um, while the shape and duration of changes in the labor market are uncertain, a core assumption embedded in our guidance is that January's trends continue throughout the balance of 2023. Um, years and years ago, I used to have a, a computer leasing business and, and did short-term rentals. This was in the 90s. I knew my business was over uh, when one year tax season never happened. That was, that was the busy season. Every accounting firm rented, rented computers for a three-month period to process all the tax returns, and then one year it didn't happen. And that's when I knew that prices had gotten to the point where everybody had excess supply. So I got, I got out of that business. That was, for me, a canary in the coal mine. Uh, if you miss your busy season... Uh, it doesn't say a lot for the rest of your year. Let's just read that again. Uh, the low point, uh, that the jobs posting remained in line with the low point of 2022 rather than following the long-standing seasonal pattern of beginning a run-up in January. Uh, and their core assumption is that January's trends continue throughout the balance of 2023. Uh, Q1. 2023 revenue guidance of 179 million at the midpoint represents a 21% decline year over year. Uh, annual guidance. Our annual guidance is based on the assumption that macroeconomic factors behind January's 15% revenue decline year over year will persist throughout 2023. Accordingly, we estimate revenue for the full year to be 770 to 790 million, representing a 14% year over year decline versus 2022 at the midpoint. Uh, is this a company that is so close to the market uh, that it sees things first? Or is there something particular to the business model of ZipRecruiter that is, be, that is being threatened by some other technology 
uh, which companies are embracing more that ZipRecruiter just hasn't seen yet. I don't know. I don't know enough about the business and about trends in that industry, but uh, interesting point for discussion. Is this a canary in the coal mine for the economy, or is this a uh, challenge to the business model of ZipRecruiter? Comments, comments, and let's see what uh, other people have to say. And that's it.